webinar will be hosted by John Manning, who will no doubt inspire you all. John has spent most of his career pricing products and services in both the corporate world and via his consulting business. In 2011, he launched the world's first and only crowdsourcing platform for pricing, and that is pricingprofits.com. So pricingprofits.com is where companies can ask a panel of global pricing experts and thought leaders what price they should charge for a product and service and why. His articles have been published in the Journal of Professional Pricing, the Journal of Revenue and Pricing Management, the Pricing Advisor and the Wigglef Journal. So before we pass the microphone off to John, I'd just like to get to know you all a little better and just get you familiar with the technology. So if everyone can just type into the messages box in the bottom right hand corner where they're actually joining us from today. Um, I think we'll find that we'll get a good spread of people all across Australia and perhaps even New Zealand. So I'm going to type in here, I'm from Sydney. As you can see, we've got two Melbourneites on there as well. Collingwood, Sharon. And there, there's always one or two New, Zealand's on, New Zealanders on there, Kate. So that's great to see. Excellent. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> An excellent spread. And just something else, just to get you all thinking a little bit more, uh, we're going to launch a poll. So this poll is going to help everyone online get to see exactly what type of audience we have, and then also assist John in tailoring his presentation. So I'm going to open this poll now, and you'll see the question is, what type of industry do you work in? So are you in a business-to-business -business environment? Are you in a business-to-consumer environment? Maybe it's be the government, maybe it's not for profit, or maybe it's other. So if there is another one out there, can you please type into the messages box and then we can all see that. And we can see these coming through quite quickly and this is probably a good segue to get John involved. Hey John. Hi Sarah, thanks for all that. So what's, where's everyone working? Oh, I think uh, there's two overwhelming categories here. And I'll close the poll and share those results with everybody before we get started. Not for profits. Wow. Yeah. In education, someone says, put in. No business to government, no business to consumer. Okay. Other, not for profit in education. Okay. Interesting. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Hey, let's um, let's kick this off. So today's webinar, I'm going to talk to you about three things. Um, number one, why pricing is getting really scary. Um, I don't know how many of you are feeling that, but for someone who's been in the pricing game for 30 years, I certainly am feeling it and I know a lot of my clients are. Then we'll segue into why pricing is so important. And then finally, how to recognise when you're pricing like this guy. So I hope, um, I hope you all remember the movie The Castle from the, from the 90s. I um, hope the guys in New Zealand saw it. Um, there was a character in there, a, a blattering lawyer by the name of Dennis Denudo, who was constantly in denial, you may remember, and it was all about Marbo and the vibe. Um, so we're going to look at sort of 10 common pricing denial traps that, uh, that companies fall into. So let's kick it off. Why is pricing getting really scary? Number, number, reason number 10, your customers have never had more power than they have today. And we'll see more of this in a moment. There's now an entire generation for whom the internet has always existed. In fact, they aren't the 2.0 movement, which is the internet of social media, of user-generated content and ratings and recommendations. And those customers have used the internet to learn more about marketers than what marketers have used the internet for to find out about their customers. Uh, now that's, that's quite a statement. There are companies, for example, Amazon does a really good job on knowing a lot about its customers, but generally they're the exception rather than the rule. Number nine. Comparisons are easy. In Australia, 5% of retailing is now conducted online. In the US, it's close to 10%. And in the UK, it's fast approaching 20%. On top of that, about 70% of all purchasing decisions are researched online. And that includes researching the price. 
The process is so easy today. You just log on to a, a price comparison website. There's a screenshot here of uh, Price Grabber. Put in what you're looking for, and typically it will sort the results cheapest price up the top. And price is the most quantifiable attribute of your product. It's what customers are going to part with to acquire the product from you. And if you appear uncompetitive on, on a price comparison website, you might not even get a look in. There was actually an interesting article in the, in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago talking about how internet retail, particularly on Amazon, Amazon, sorry, are deliberately maintaining the lowest price, even if it's by a cent or a penny, just so they show up in the top of those price comparison searches. Some retailers are using software that enables them to change their prices every 15 minutes. And the software boasts of being able to change prices for 2 million of its customers' products and services per hour. Uh, so the, the velocity of these price changes is getting really, really fast. As the numbers I've just mentioned suggest, there are still a lot of customers shopping in stores. So 5% of retail in Australia currently online, that's 95% in bricks and mortar, you would hope. But that doesn't mean you can just rest on your laurels if you're a bricks and mortar retailer. Most of these customers walking into stores these days have increasing likelihood that they've got these, these barcode apps or scan and scram apps which allow them to, to scan a barcode and possibly find a cheaper price online and then just walk straight out of the store. We know customers don't like price increases, but they're not going to tell you that anymore. They're going to tell everybody they know, whether it be on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, or other social media platforms. In the US, in the summer of 2011, a company by the name of Netflix changed its pricing. So instead of its customers subscribing once to DVD rentals and online streaming services, it split the services in two. Within one week, it had 82,000 hostile comments on its Facebook page. Number six, there's a lot of price guarantees out there offered by retailers of all types. We'll match the competitor's price, we'll beat the competitor's price, we're never knowingly undersold, just to name a few. And I'm sure most of the, um, the people attending the webinar from Australia are familiar with, with Bunnings and their lowest price guarantee. But those redemption rates on those sorts of guarantees are typically very, very low, and they require the customers to do a whole lot of searching and suing and throwing. This website, Iona, actually monitors what they call your shopping hangover. So what you do is once you've made a purchase, you scan the receipt on their app, send it into it, and they will monitor the, the, the price at that retailer for a price drop and claim the disc difference back from you at a later point. So it is automating that, um, those uh, price guarantees that these companies offer. Service your peril, number five. Nobody's perfect, including people responsible for pricing. In 2005 on Expedia, um, there were hotel rooms at the Hilton Hotels in Osaka and Tokyo advertised for $2 or $4 a night. Um, one guest actually booked a room at the Tokyo Hilton for a full year because it was going to be cheaper for him to live there than it would be at home. This is a shot of a website called Pression.de, which doesn't exist anymore, but that doesn't mean it's not going to uh, pop up again in another form at some point in the future. The site would deliberately crawl websites for pricing mistakes, just like that Expedia one I described to you just before, and then it would send an email to its, uh, the people who subscribe to these alerts saying, we think there's a pricing error on this particular website, go and grab a deal while you can. Number four, some of you 
may be using competitive pricing strategies, so you just charge what the competitor is charging, which in effect is akin to outsourcing your pricing to the competition. This particular Chinese website, handsup.cn, goes one step further and it actually lets the customers recommend the products they want to buy and allowing them to name the price that they want to pay. Some retailers will be particularly alarmed about this. I actually look at it from another perspective. I think it sounds like a great product development and pricing research platform. For those of you that are in um, that are professional professional service providers, um, you guys need to be scared as well because there is increasingly more and more pushback about the billable hour. Customers don't want to buy your time, especially when it's billed in say six minute intervals, as happens in some industries. They want to buy a solution to their product, whether it's a tax return, the conveyance of their house, or a set of architectural drawings. And the people in these professional service industries have so many alternative uh, pricing models that they can use, uh, the benefits of which will accrue to the early adopters. Still on B2B or business to business pricing, um, as in B2C markets, customers increasingly know exactly what they want. They know your products and services are fit for purpose, your brand is strong, your aftermarket and sales support is second to none, but they still want your, you to respond to their RFQ, their request for a quote, or their tender, or their auction, and if you're involved in any of those, you can. there's a pretty good chance it's only going to come down to one thing, and that is price. And why do customers know exactly what they want? Well, that's my number one reason why pricing is getting scary, particularly in business to business markets. This little kid in the red shorts is the pricing guy, and the guy he's facing on the other side of the, um, the image there, that is your customer's procurement department. I ask people who attend my pricing workshops if their company has a pricing department and a procurement department. We'll ask you that very same question again in a minute and we'll see what, um, what pops up. So that's the 10 reasons why pricing is getting really scary. That brings us to the, sort of the second or the middle part of this webinar, why is pricing so important? Well, in case you had guessed on the previous 10 points, price is important to customers, so it should be important to you. One of the great pricing orators of our time is this man, Warren Buffett. Many of you are probably familiar with the first quote here, price is what you pay, value is what you get. But during an interview with the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission in 2011, he gave us two more pearls of wisdom. If you have to have a prayer session before raising prices, then you've got a terrible business. And secondly, the single most important decision in evaluating a business is pricing power. That raises the question, what is pricing power? And this is one definition that I like. The ability of you to get the price you deserve for the value that you provide. And if you look to the right here, um, try and picture your product or service on, on this graph here. You've got two axes, one showing the necessities at one end and discretionary at the other, and another axis showing unique and commodity. Have a think about where your product sits and have a guess at which, uh, which part of the matrix or the two by two pricing power is typically found. And if anyone um, wants to comment in the messages box on where their pricing sits, that'll be great. We can all then um, have a look and see where everyone's pricing currently sits. So you're probably thinking to yourself, hang on a minute, I don't have a Rolls Royce or I'm not selling an Apple product, but that doesn't mean that you can't learn from these companies. There's a fantastic quote here, never look at a pricing approach from other companies or industries and think, well that'll never work in my business. 
that sort of thinking is the kiss of death. Instead, always ask, how can that kind of pricing or some variation possibly be applied to my business? A couple of graphs here that illustrate the importance of pricing. They both show very similar results. So it doesn't really matter whether you're looking at the left or the right. How, how can you improve operating profit at your business? Well, if you can improve your fixed costs by 1%, an improvement in fixed costs is obviously to decrease them, on average you'll get a 2.3% improvement in operating profit. If you can increase your volumes by 1%, that typically results in a 3.3% improvement in operating costs, operating profit. Variable costs typically will give you a 7.8% uplift. But price is the most powerful lever you've got. So if you can increase your price by just 1%, typically that flows straight through to the bottom line and you'll see an 11% uplift in operating profit. The figures on the right, are, I'm sorry, on the left are US research. The figures on the right are Canadian research. And this sort of research gets repeated time and time again and the results are always very, very similar. Uh, you can get double digit growth out of a 1% increase in price. Um, so have a think about whether this afternoon, tomorrow, the end of this week, next week, could you increase your price by 1% because it would be very, very powerful for you. That 1% um, varies from industry to industry. In some industries it doesn't have as big an impact. If you look at the bottom of the graph here, Banking and investment, you may only get 2 or 3% improvement in operating profit, but in an industry like automotive and transportation, you may get considerably more. And the quotes here really drive this message home as well. Kroger, the US uh, retail food chain, if they could get people to spend 1% more on a basket of goods, so a basket, they spend $101 on a basket instead of $100, they estimate their net profits would triple. Conversely, Coca-Cola have estimated that a 1% reduction in price translates to a $20 million loss in operating profits. And this last one is my favourite. In 2001, Continental Airlines carried 44 million passengers at an average fare of $193 and they made a loss. If they had charged an average fare of $195, they would have broken even. The difference is 1.04%. So you can see in that particular case, 1% can mean the difference between uh, loss and break even. Let's go back to Apple for a minute. So this graph shows you that 2% of the purchase decision when buying an Apple PC is associated with price. Conversely, 98% of an Apple purchase decision is not associated with price. That means it's associated with things like its brand and its features and things like that. Unlike many of the other companies here, what Apple has successfully done is desensitise their customers to price and sensitise them to those other attributes which you can collectively call value. I don't know if anybody wants to have a guess why Dell might be the second on the uh, on the right on the graph. Does anyone want to sort of plug a thought on that in the in the message box? Any takers? No? Okay. A lot of people think that is actually Dell, the old Dell's online only selling model. So when you went and bought a Dell and bought it online, you would be put, you would have all these offers and upgrades put in front of you, you know, take a memory upgrade, free printer and stuff like that. And that process actually did exactly the same thing. It desensitised the customers to price and sensitised them to value. So that's the, the reason why Dell is um, is probably at 8% when it comes to price. So this is probably the most congested slide you're going to see in this uh, in this little talk. Um, probably about 70 to 80% of companies 
in, in most countries around the world resort to cost plus pricing. So they work out their costs, they add on a margin, cross their fingers and hope for the best. Um, there are many, many more alternative pricing models, strategies and tactics that, uh, that companies can pursue. Um, and I've plotted them here on a wheel of fortune because you know, there may be a, a different pricing model here. You could spin the wheel of fortune and you may actually come up with a better pricing model for your business. Um, so I'll just briefly sort of go around the, um, around the wheel a bit. The traditional pricing models, in, according to my classification, is cost plus pricing, pricing according to the competition. Non-linear or two-part pricing like the electric companies do, the gas companies and so forth. And then your dynamic pricing or revenue and yield management which the airlines and hotels do. The actual models that we prefer um, with, with clients and on pricingprofits.com are value-based. So you actually try and work out the value of the product or service to the customer either qualitatively, which is customer value analysis, or economically, such as using economic value analysis. And that really just means working out how does your product increase a client's revenue, reduce their expenses, or minimise their risk. There's a whole series of time-based pricing models, which I won't go into a lot of detail, but time is a fantastic metric in which you can price against, um, and hopefully you can capitalise on pricing amnesia, so um, people forget about pricing over time. Software pricing models, there is again a wide variety of those. They can be user-based, usage-based, time-based and location-based, just to name a few. Legal and professional services, um, I had coffee with, with Jess, who's hopefully on the, on the webinar right now. We spent a bit of time talking about um, the, the billable hour and its, uh, its imminent demise. There are a whole range of alternative pricing models that professional services can use um, that are more focused on outputs, deliverables and things like that. There's a whole range of, of digital advertising models and I sort of have those in a category of their own because there are so many businesses out there on the web that are dependent on um, digital advertising because they, if you look at the next model, a uh, group of models, they uh, actually cross-subsidise either directly or indirectly what their website does with advertising products. You've got freemium as well, uh, where for those of you that are on LinkedIn, there's, uh, there's only roughly about 25% of users on LinkedIn who are paying and everybody else is on the free version. There's pay what you want, um, probably most made most famous by Radiohead releasing a, a pay what you want album a couple of years ago. And then as I mentioned, the, the, uh, the cross subsidy models. Uh, you've got paired products, razors and blades, second hand products, bundling and unbundling, and pay as you go. Uh, you've got some interesting gimmicks that have been tried with pricing. You know, there's a gym in Denmark where you only pay if you don't show up in a week. There are doctors in China that only get paid when you're, when you're healthy because when you're sick, they're not doing their job and so forth. And then finally, there are options. So and there's a, a wide variety of options there. So the key message there really is you have more choice than just cost plus pricing, which 70 to 80% of companies are using. Okay, so before we, um, before we talk about the common pricing traps and whether you're pricing like Dennis Denudo, we're just going to do another poll. So Sarah, if you can just bring up the poll. Absolutely. So we're just going to bring up the second poll for today. And there we go. In a business that has a procurement or purchasing department, an independent pricing department, or maybe both, or perhaps neither. So if you can just uh, select either A, B, C, or D, and then we'll be able to share the results with everybody online. So by independent, I mean it's, it's a standalone department, so it's not just done as a task by finance or product management or someone like that. 
Great, and we can see we've got uh, just over half of the people responding, so I'll close those and then share those with you, John. Okay, so we've got there. We've got a few people with an independent pricing department. That's really interesting. Okay, because what when I I do a lot of workshops, um, and one of the questions I ask people attending my workshops is that very question: How many of you have a procurement department, and how many of you have a pricing department? The results are usually that 80 to 100 percent of people who attend my workshops work in a company that has a procurement department but 20% or less work in a company that has a pricing department. Excuse me. And what that means is these companies are more concerned about the price they're paying for goods and services than the price they're getting for their own goods and services. So uh, you've broken the mould a little bit there, uh, but um, that's, it, it's worth keeping in mind. So many companies are more focused on the price they pay rather than the price they get. Okay, so I'm going to do now is to take you through my 10 common pricing traps. So this is uh, the Dennis Denudo of pricing. Oh, that was where we meant to be when the poll was on, never mind. Trap number 10, leaving pricing too late in the marketing process. So it does amaze me how many companies are just about to go to market with a product or service when somebody says, how much does it cost? Really, pricing shouldn't be part of a go-to-market strategy. It should actually be part of a product development strategy. Better still, build a product to a specific price point that customers are prepared to pay. That way you can be confident that you will provide value. Um, and you see, you see examples of that quite often. Um, the move towards a $1,000 car, a $100 laptop, and a $20 mobile phone are all sort of value-based approaches to pricing and actually building a product to a specific price point rather than building a product and working out what price to charge for it and whether it will sell. Trap number nine, and this is a really common one that I'm, I'm seeing in, with increasing frequency, it's top-down pricing to fix the profit and loss. So you hear people say, we've got a $2 million revenue shortfall in the profit and loss, let's jack up prices. Uh, this, is not, this is a company-focused approach to pricing and it's not a customer-centric approach to pricing and it's fraught with danger. The best way to increase prices is to increase value and conversely, if you're going to uh, reduce prices, take away value as well. Chap number eight, using the same average across all products. Many companies uh, adopt an across the board approach to price changes, whether it's an increase or a decrease. This ignores things like demand, value, and different customer segments, and as a result, it's, it's definitely leaving money on the table. I mentioned this earlier. Um, cost plus pricing is a suboptimal approach to pricing. Customers don't pay you because of what your costs are. They pay you because of the value that you provide to them. Trap number six, taking too narrow a competitive perspective. Many companies assume their competitors are company A and company B and they will match them on price. The reality is commonly very different, but customers' consideration set may be far wider than just those two competitors. Number five is to price to the general level of the competition. Again, here companies often move prices up and down to the general level of the competition. And this is often to the detriment of specific customer segments who may be prepared to pay more for a product or service. And again, that, that highlights another critical um, part of the pricing toolbox is to segment your customers. Um, and if you're just segmenting your customers 
using descriptive warm and fuzzy terms, it's, it's meaningless. Segmentation should be actionable. Um, and by actionable, I mean that you can charge these customers a different price or you have a different marketing offer, collateral communication strategy with them. Track number four, using the wrong research tools. So companies often move price based on gut feel, intuition or Salesforce feedback, all of which are qualitative. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a role for qualitative feedback and research, but it's probably not as important as actually hard numbers and quantitative research. Trap number three, mechanical price changes. Again, this is one of the most common pricing traps I see companies fall into. They always do 5% or they always do CPI or inflation based price changes and always at one particular time of the year, normally the start of the financial year. Now unless you're in a regulated market, say health insurance or something like that, or you sell an annual product, you should really be looking to review and change your prices if warranted any time your market conditions change your, or your value changes and that's just to name a few. The other thing is that competitors always don't start business competing against you on the first day of the financial year. Number two, scenario modelling. Scenario modelling is great, don't get me wrong on that. It tells us what outcomes are attractive. Unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily tell us which of the assumptions are valid and worth paying more attention to than others. And then finally, number one, it's unfair on customers. Believe it or not, you do occasionally hear this. But you run a business, your customers are free to choose whether to buy from you or not. But I guarantee if you link your price increases to changes in value, you communicate and execute those price changes accordingly, uh, your customers will continue buying from you. Uh, it is all in the execution. So they are my 10 traps. Um, I want to finish with a little case study and this is at, uh, at Sarah's request. Uh, but to do the case study, I need to little tell, you, tell you a little bit about pricingprofits.com first. Not to get in shameless self-promotion, but because it's actually quite a revolutionary approach to pricing and we're the only website in the world that does this. So it's, a, it's an online pricing advisory service where you can ask a panel of global pricing experts and thought leaders what price you should charge for a product or service and why. It's affordable, uh, it's $600 to run a project, it's accessible on the internet, it's timely with a seven day turnaround and it's egalitarian because I'm giving you access to you know, some of the smartest minds in pricing which typically work um, in you know, top 100 companies and so forth. The experts on the site have got over 200 years of, of pricing experience and have worked in, it's, it's a, a number bigger than 37 different industries at the moment, but they're all sort of heavily qualified with not only pricing experience but marketing and commercial experience. So what happens is you can, uh, you can go onto the website, create a logon and so forth and then ask these experts what price you should charge for a product or service and they'll answer three questions for you. They'll tell you what price to charge, they'll tell you the rationale for that price point and any other advice that they want to give you. Um, now, I'm going to tell you about one little project we did which is that there's, there's quite a few of you on the webinar that uh, expressed an interest in pricing webinars. Uh, the closest product we've done to that is an online organisational storytelling course. Um, which is a bit of a mouthful and Yamini who actually runs this business has had to leave the webinar a bit early, I saw before, um, but um, in her absence I thank her for letting me talk about her business. So what they did was they launched an online coaching program um, for, which comprises five chapters and 30 videos in organisational storytelling. Now if you've ever watched uh, a TED talk with say someone like Malcolm Gladwell, you'll know what storytelling is all about. 
It helps business people increase sales because it enables them to sort of sell without selling, if you like. Improves internal and external communication. It improves influence and presentation. And it allows you to ditch PowerPoint. Uh, the ladies of this business actually want to, their strategy was to maximise profits, sales and revenue. Uh, their target market is entrepreneurs and small business owners worldwide. And the only real competition that they had was, um, any, the only thing that was remotely similar was a, a, a guy in the US uh, selling a toolkit and a CD for $99. There was also someone selling cassette tapes, believe it or not. When, uh, so all this came from a series of questions we ask in the, in the process. Um, we don't ask about costs, but we do ask if there is a floor price, a price that um, they don't want to go below, and um, the, the ladies running this business told us what that was. The, um, the experts sort of then reviewed that. They, they may do a bit of additional research and so forth, but they say, they came back with a variety of, of responses. They felt it needed to be priced below the psychological threshold of $1,000 because that's, that's a four-digit number, so it should be a three-digit number. They thought they should start high and come down if need be because it is always easier to come down in price than to try and put prices up. They felt it was competing with uh, conferences, which typically vary in cost between $1,000 and $3,500. Uh, but overall, the, the four or five experts that worked on this program project recommended two major things, a selling price of $848.50, and they also recommended um, producing different versions of the product, which is a sort of recommendation that's a little bit beyond pricing. It's got product implications as well, but they were the two key recommendations that we provided. And as you can see, Success Through Stories, which is run by two ladies that run a business called 1001 Words, are selling their, um, their story mastery program for a dollar fifty more than what we recommended. So you can see they're eight hundred and fifty dollars. And they also developed two other versions of their product there which you can see on the left. And the centre. So that's us to the end of the uh, of the talk. Um, as I said, I think pricing is getting quite scary. It is important, um, and hopefully, I've um, identified some of those traps that you may be uh, falling into and and can now avoid. And we are more than happy to uh, the flow of, open the floor for discussion, if you like the online for discussion and uh, take a few questions from people. Excellent. And if anyone does have any questions for John, um, please type them in the messages box in the bottom right hand corner, whether it be um, something that you're currently doing and you want some advice on price or maybe something that you're looking to. Um, so first of all, John, uh, Rosemary asked a question earlier on and this is um, it's, it's quite overall. So she's a copy editor and copywriter and she's experiencing a lot of problems with pricing. So what she's starting to find is that she's either too cheap or too expensive and then loses the work. So is there any advice around that that you may have? Uh, so my, what I would be looking at there is to, again, to try and segment the customers. So are there categories of customers that she's working with, with frequently? Um, who are the ones that are pushing back on price? Um, and maybe try and develop fixed prices for particular market segments. So I'm not sure, Rosemary, if you're using some charging by the hour and so forth. I know it's a, it's a tough area to work in because of things like content collection and things like that. Um, but generally my advice with professional services is to actually segment your market um, develop fixed prices which are hopefully going to, you know, more than adequately compensate for the effort that you've got to put in. There will be things in less time than you've allowed and others will take more. Um, hopefully there is more, um, more, more guilt associated with um, perhaps you know, charging more, you know, doing doing projects more efficiently and, um, may, you know, maybe charging, you know, 
the price, um, charging a higher price when it could have been a bit lower price. The other thing you can, and a lot of procurement people seem to be asking for this, is to quote a guaranteed maximum price. So, um, you know, the price is going to be X, but if I do it in less time or with less effort or you cooperate more with me and I can turn it around more efficiently, it won't be any more than that. In fact, it may be less. Um, so there's quite a, there's, there is some other options there that, um, that Rosemary can think about. Right, and we did have a pre-question that came through earlier from um, Jennifer. So Jennifer says that they um, offer webinars to their members and their non-members as well. What they're looking at doing is discounting rates for current members. Does discounting rates or offering these webinars for free have the ability to lower the value of the service? Is it, is it a membership organisation? Yes, so she said members and non-members, so I think they're trying to increase their membership. So I think my, my thinking there would actually be to, um, to to roll in the price of the webinars into a membership fee, um, so that way there's sort of, um, you know, no, no parting with your money, to, uh, you know, if, whenever the webinar rolls around that you're interested in, that people are automatically sort of enrolled in them. Um, but at the same point, I think the, you know the idea of charging non-members um, to attend these webinars is a is a good idea, and I think that also you know it's beneficial for the members to have some visibility of that because that then illustrates the value that they are getting either with discounted membership or with um, you know with um, the webinars included in their, their membership dues. Okay, great. And Helen has also asked a question. So she said that they had a potential client who posted on Facebook that their company, which is a graphic design agency, was a bit pricey. So what response would you have made? Um, Helen tried to explain the value of having a quality logo and to see this um, as a business investment, but do you think that was the best approach used? I think posted on Facebook that our company graphic design was a bit pricey. Um, so my, my response to that would, so I, I would assume, Helen, that at some point a proposal has gone out to the particular clients for a, a graphic design. If, um, if the response has been that you're a bit pricey, my first question would be, okay, so this is, this is the package we've offered you, this is the service we're going to do for you. We can, we can more than happily meet your, um, you know, give you a sharper price, but what, what component of this don't you want, which will enable me to give you uh, a cheaper price? So, you know, if, it's, um, if you've guaranteed, say, a seven day turnaround and so forth, you might say, okay, well, I'm not going to do this in seven days, we'll do it in 14 or 21 or so forth. But then the key point there is, um, Try and actually work out exactly uh, what price give and get. So if you're going to give them a better price, get something in return. So get something that is beneficial for you um, to take them down um, to, a, to a price they can afford. But at the same time, I think you, you, you need to have a walk away price as well. So there may be a point, a, a price point where you actually don't do, you know, don't, don't provide the graphic and so forth. And hopefully you don't have to get to that, but you can just through through gives and gets, and then you know you know maybe if there's if there's some scope creep or so forth, you say, well look, this is um, there's been a bit of scope creep here, so you know we um, we're going to vary the, um, the proposal here. But that would be my approach: gives and gets, try and um, take out value to give them a smarter price. Great, thanks John. Um, that seems to be all the questions that have come through now. Um, so before I hand it over to John to wrap it up, um, and we've just got a link posted there by uh, Kathy, by the way, and I think uh, Savio posted one earlier as well. Um, before, um, before we hand it over to John to wrap up, I'd just like to thank you all for coming on behalf of Redback and also Pricing Profits. And as discussed earlier, 
if you click out exit on the top right hand corner you'll then be redirected to an online survey so this survey really is to gauge your feedback on the webinar to help us improve and to also see what other topics you may be interested in this series um, so feel free to complete that and if you do you will actually receive an email within 48 hours with a recording um, so once again thanks to John thanks everyone for joining we hope um, we provided you with some insight and valuable information for your lunch break and I'd now like to hand it over to John to wrap up. Yeah, I haven't got much to say. All my contact details are there. I'm more than happy to enter into pricing banter with you on, on Twitter or Facebook or whatever the case may be. Um, I'm, I'm already um, having some interesting banter with Richard Smith who um, hopefully is, is listening in somewhere. Um, I have a, a YouTube channel, Pricing Profit. TV, so you can uh, um, you can sort of recap some of the um, the stories in this webinar there as well, and I write a fortnightly column for leading company as well. So, um, and you're more than welcome to jump on the pricing profits and sign up to uh, a newsletter. And there's also a download centre there, so there's some podcasts, there's a calculator, there's an ebook, and so forth. And if you want to know anything more about pricing, that's how you get in touch. Excellent. Thanks once again, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.